on. If you are looking for some first round of March Madness trends and statistics to help fill out your bracket, you've come to the right place. I guarantee you after watching this video, you will adjust your bracket with some of these stats. We've got some great trends with just about all these seeds here. Here's a quick overview touching on, you know, the one seed matchup, seven, eight seed, nine seed, 10, 11. These are prime matchups where people are looking for some upsets. we got some great stats there. And you can never neglect the first four in game. Um, seems like a team is winning in that round and advancing just about every single year. Before we get any further, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. We've got a ton of March Madness content already out and a ton more to come, and you're not going to want to miss any of it. Let's leave with the first stat I want to talk about. Um, it's one that's pretty much inherent in most people's minds, but the one seed winning the first two rounds and reaching the Sweet 16 86% of the time, you know, it doesn't seem like picking the one seed to lose in, over the first weekend is a wise move. It certainly happens, but 86% of the time it's not happening. Do you see one of these number one seeds this year losing in the first two rounds? Um, I mean, I, I certainly don't see any of them losing in the first round like Purdue last year. But, um, yeah, I see the boards lined up fairly nicely for these teams to advance. I definitely think that's the case for Houston, um, at, whether they play Nebraska or Texas A&M in the second round. I think those are two teams that Houston should definitely take care of. And then same with Purdue, just looking off the matchups between Utah State and TCU. Mm -hmm. These aren't like super strong teams that I – feel worried about i mean utah state won the mwc conference in the regular season and then yeah. they went to overtime with like fresno state in the first round so <laughs> not i think utah state is a very weak eight seed um and i can almost say the same about nebraska and texas a&m these are two teams that kind of played pretty poorly for most of the year other than they got hot down the stretch mm -hmm. uh but yeah i mean they can't. They looked pretty good in their conference tournaments, but I think Purdue and Houston are really safe to make the Sweet 16. I also think, I mean, UConn. I think they're safe in the sense it's just UConn. It's the best team in college basketball. I don't love that they they will probably have to play Florida Atlantic in the second round, um, especially if you watched a lot of March Madness last year. Florida Atlantic during that run looked like they could beat anybody, including UConn when they were beating everybody. Um, they just play fast. They have a lot of guys who could shoot threes, and they have a seven-footer to match up with Klingon. So um, I'm not super worried. I just think that's the, probably the toughest second-round matchup of the one seeds. But not I mean, I got to stick with UConn. I'm not going to really think FAU playing in the American League with eight losses is going to, to pull off the big upset against UConn. So I think – UConn's pretty safe. The one where I think it gets pretty interesting, and it's probably still a little bit of a reach, but uh, Michigan State or Mississippi State versus North Carolina, I think That's those could be doing. really. I think those could be really good games. Um, and honestly, Mississippi State or Michigan State, I think could could really give UNC a run for their money, especially mm -hmm. after how bad North Carolina looked in the conference championship. I know that's nitpicky. Like they won the regular season, they made it to the championship game, but they really didn't look like they could beat NC State. Um, but more of that has to do with a massive, like, dominant post play. So I think Michigan State does not have that at all. So I don't think they really struggle with Michigan State. And then Mississippi State, on the other hand, um, Tolu Smith was a great player last year, but he missed, like, the first half of this season. Hasn't quite been the same. So I think if you do want to pick one, you're probably going to pick one over North Carolina. But – for the most part, I, I do think they're pretty safe, but I, that that second round game in the West region is going to be close, at least. Yeah, it seems like a strong batch of number one seeds this year, but you know it seems to happen every now and then. And, and like you said, I think Mississippi State or Michigan State are probably the toughest matchup outside of FAU that you could draw in that second round as a one seed. Taking a look at the seven versus twelve seed here, um, you're looking at the seven seed. Tennessee matchup. A lot of people like to circle this one as an upset here. And, you know, Tennessee certainly has its um, time of shining. It's a seven seed, but I think people exaggerate how big of an upset this is. All time, you get the seven seed winning this one 60% um, of the time, which I think is pretty solid. But I do want to say when the 10 seed does win, they are doing incredibly well um, against that two seed matchup there in the round of 32, winning it 42% of the time. So knowing this, I got two questions. Is there 
seven seeds you like more than the 10 seeds, but don't want them to advance to the Sweet 16. And on the flip side, what 10 seeds do you see upsetting the seven seed and then making it past the two seed spot and into the Sweet 16? Yeah, so I think just looking at the seven seeds to like win the first game, um, I do think, and I know it's a popular pick, but I do think Washington State will be a pretty solid bet against Drake. Um, just they have a lot of size, and Drake is a little bit one dimensional. Um, that DeVries guy. Yeah, leaning leaning on DeVries. He's a great player, but I mean, I do think Washington State will match up fairly well. They have a lot of bigger guards that they should be able to rotate on them. Uh, and then one that I do. They got underseeded. Um, this is on the flip side more so, but Nevada is a 10 seed. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people argued they were the best team in the mid uh, MWC this last year. And if you remember a couple of years ago, I'm blanking if they made it all the way to the final four. I think they did, but Oregon State um, did, a few did. years ago, they made it all the way to the final four. And that was with Jared Lucas, uh, who's now the point guard at Nevada. So you wow. have a starting wow. point guard. He's your leading scorer who has already done it before with the lower ranked team. I believe they were a 12 seed Mm -hmm. in that run. Uh, But yeah, he's on Nevada. They have another elite scorer in Keenan Blackshear at the the three spot. Uh, Honestly, this Nevada team would have been absolutely filthy if they didn't lose a couple of guys to transfers. One of their forwards is on Texas Tech now, Darian Williams, and their center from last year is now on LSU. But if these guys all came back, this Nevada team would be absolutely disgusting. I mean, they still are, uh, especially with Jared Lucas and just his resume in tournaments over the last couple of years. So I think Nevada is a really good pick to beat Dayton. And I don't love their matchup with Arizona, but they play really great defense. So I think this is a solid team, especially the 10 seed that, that you could get making a little bit of a run here um, at the 10 spot. And then the other one I really do like actually is UVA or Colorado state. I just think between Texas and Tennessee, like those would be your, probably your first two rounds. I think both of those teams have really fallen off the last month. And then Tennessee, especially the last like two weeks. uh, I was pretty, I mean, I guess not super surprised. They still got a two seed, but they have definitely not been playing as a, at the level of a two seed. So I think the winner of UVA or Colorado state, could be another good pick down there just because more so on your matchups. I think they have an easier matchup. Like if it was Nevada versus Tennessee, I would love to take Nevada in that game. Um, Gotcha. Cause I am a little bit higher on Arizona. Uh, And then the last spot, I think the last one's really tough. The one we didn't mention yet, but Florida will play the winner of Boise and Colorado. Mm -hmm. Florida's looks phenomenal, but they are going to be without their seven footer, Micah Hanloden. So, I mean, that's obviously going to hurt this team. So, I mean, maybe that's another spot that you, you grab a Boise or Colorado because Florida is now out there starting center. And if you think it's going to make a huge difference, that'd be a good spot. And then especially in that region, I think Marquette, in my mind, is the weakest two seed, mm-hmm. especially with Tyler Kolick's, like, quad injury. We don't really know if he's even going to play in the first round. Um, so, yeah, I think the winner of that Florida-Boise game could definitely – give Marquette a, a game. And I think either of them could beat him. And that's great to know, especially, and that leads into something we'll talk about a little bit later about some of these first four in teams, you know, getting hot in this tournament here. You look at um, this matchup here with eight and nine seed, you know, it truly is, and the committee said this, it truly is a coin flip game with eight and nine seed being of equal weight. And you see the nine seed actually owning the favorability all time in the matchup winning 76 games to 72 games. So like I said, it really is a true coin flip in round one, but the disparity between these two teams is shown in the second round where, you know, you obviously, we talked about a little bit of the one seeds making a sweet 16, um, but the eight seeds, when they do play that one seed spot in the round of 32, they are twice as likely to win as the nine seed. So even though we see the nine seed winning the game against the eight matchup, more often than not, it's the eight seed that sees better success in the second round here. Uh, I know we touched on it and in that uh, first, the number one seed, make it Sweet 16. But just to reiterate, um, it seems like based on what you said, FAU is the spot here, maybe uh, Mississippi State, if they're going to win that 8-9 matchup. 
Um, those are the right. guys that you'd circle to potentially, you know, 21% isn't great. You know, you're not, you're still looking at some pretty long odds, but it's certainly better than 9% for a number nine seed to take down a one. And it, and it happens, but uh, eight seeds are much better equipped to do so. Yeah. And I think um, outside of the two regions we just talked about, I, I see this really ringing true and for the South and the Midwest. You look at those matchups, it's Nebraska versus Texas A&M. I mean, that game in my mind is kind of a coin flip. A&M on papers probably looks like the better team, but Nebraska has been shooting the ball extremely well from three. Mm-hmm. Tominaga, um, Bryce Williams, and then even the post ranked mess. So I think if Nebraska gets that win against A&M, who knows? I mean, I don't think they're going to beat Houston, but I think they have a better shot than A&M with their ability to hit threes and well put some points on the board. And I think I could say the exact same thing about the Utah State versus TCU game. I think TCU is a better team, but I I think Utah State has a better shot of beating Purdue just because I, TCU's a really poor three-point shooting team. Yeah, so, I mean, I like – yeah. I like to take a little bit more variability if I'm going to pick a team to grab an upset. So, I mean, yeah, between TCU and a and I think they're both good teams, but I think their floor or their ceiling is a little bit lower in their ability to knock off like those elite. Yeah, it seems like if you really are trying to make a David versus Goliath upset in March, it really comes in the back of one or two guys on the team just getting absolutely hot from three. And it's tough to guard that because you have so much space. If you have a guy in the post, you can better defend that versus a guy being able to run and lock outside the three-point line um, playing one-on-one ball there. Moving on to the 11 seeds, I think it's no surprise at this point that 11 seeds against the six seed is kind of the new 5-12 matchup that everyone circles on their bracket. Since 2011, 11 seeds are 50-50, really coin flips against six seed, winning 20 times, losing 20 times. Um, I think they've had a lot of success lately just in the first round, but even beyond that, you see them uh, moving on the sweet, sweet 16 a lot. More than one 11 seed per tournament over the last 10-plus tournaments have made it to the Sweet 16. So not only, my question to you is not only what 11 seed do you think has the upset against the six seed, but even one step further has potential to make it to the Sweet 16. Yeah, so so I think there's three, three of the four. I would honestly say you have a pretty good shot of you're gonna win this first round game. The one I would completely avoid here is BYU versus Duquesne. Duquesne, if you look at all the net BPI everything, Duquesne is by far the worst 11 seed. I don't know how they got an 11 seed. They should be more of like a 13, 14. Um, People are kind of explaining it that they beat VCU in the championship and then the bracketologists didn't know what to do, so they just slotted them then at the 11. But Duquesne is a really bad 11 seed. Like, I would I would avoid them. I mean, watch them probably win now, but <laughs> um, I'd, I'm not going to be taking them. Uh, I think the other three are 50-50 shots. I mean, NC State could beat Texas Tech. Um, I don't know what the spread is, but – uh, Warren Washington, too. He's the seven-footer on Texas Tech, transferred over mm-hmm. from ASU. But if he's out, then they don't really match up well in the paint with slowing down DJ Burns. I mean, we just saw it, the whole ACC tournament. The guy was just electric. Like, you just literally fed him in the paint every play, and he either made a left-handed shot or they doubled and he got an assist on, like, pretty much every single possession. It was it was a clinic. Um, so, yeah, you kind of need – a massive or at least a big paint presence to slow down this NC State team from what I've seen. And Texas Tech with that injury might be in trouble at that 11 spot. Yeah, minus five for Texas Tech in that game, by the way. Okay, right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do think the Texas Tech guards are a lot better. And, I mean, when it hits March, that's usually what you see dictate the game. But, but yeah, I think you might get a big um, advantage in the post there with NC State. And you come uh, against another... the NC State and all the other teams you're about to mention too, not just kill your thunder. You're going against teams that are right hot after winning their conference tournament too. And so often in March, it seems like these teams that are hot stay hot. And that really has some staying power in this tournament. Something about the confidence, the momentum, the camaraderie of it all, something about it is contagious and it seems to have a real effect. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you see these lower seeds make runs too. It's not like they just win one big game. They come back two days later and they beat another even higher seed. Um, so yeah, it's definitely definitely true. Like you know, there's something, and there's something to be said about playing with nothing to lose. 
you're an 11 seed. You're you're the underdog. Some people on that team or the coach saying, you know, guys, we're just happy to be here. Let's go out there and play our hearts out too. Versus yeah, all the be pressure of being, yeah, all the pressure of being a top seed. Um, you know, that can really tighten players up and it makes a difference. But playing loose, playing fun basketball, like 11 seeds often do, um, it's a recipe for success. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the next one who I think this would be another popular 11 seed pick. I mean, three of the four we just talked about, NC State, they won the ACC. Mm -hmm. Another 11 seed in the the Midwest region is Oregon. They just won the Pac-12. Yeah. Um, we have talked about kind of how weak the Pac-12 is, though, so I'm not I'm not going to put a ton of uh, just thought or weight into that. I do think Oregon's a good basketball team, um, and Folly Dante, too. Like, this is another team they had guys injured at the start of the year. They got them halfway through uh, the season. So, so, yes, I mean, they are definitely a better team than they were for the first two months. But I think South Carolina is wildly um, underseeded at number six. They only lost – what was it, like seven games the whole season, including the conference tournament. So in the SEC, I mean, that's unreal. I just don't think they got enough recognition for as well as they played. Like they weren't supposed to be any good this year. And that would give you a lot of reason to not take them to win your whole bracket or go that far. I mean, there's a lot of stats that go against that. But I just think they're going to come in kind of into the game with a chip on their shoulder, thinking they should have got a four seed or something like that. So I just, I think South Carolina is going to, going to show up that first first game. I mean, who knows? Oregon is kind of an even matchup for them. They have the paint presence, which I normally like to go with. I just think narrative-wise, I mean, South Carolina lost seven games. Like, all of those other teams in the Power Five conferences that lost seven games are, like, three seeds and above. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think they got kind of screwed on that. And it's interesting that, you know, the odds makers still aren't giving South Carolina credit. They're basically in a picking game. They're, they're minus one um, against – Oregon here in that first round. So still not getting the credit that, you know, a team with seven losses usually would be given. Right. I mean, they have some bad losses where you could be like, oh, like they really let that one go or that kind of showed their true color. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm just eventually by the end of the season, you kind of got to go with these teams. I mean, that's what made me a ton of money on FAU last year. They came in with zero or one losses. They still got put as an eight seed. And I was like, I mean, in a pick em game, you lost one game. Like you just know how to win games at that point. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it is a close basketball game, you want to pick a team that knows how to win a game. Um, and for me, in my mind, that's South Carolina. Uh, but the last 6-11 matchup we didn't talk about yet, um, it's my favorite 11 seed. I've been saying it the last couple of weeks, if you've been watching the Ken Palm videos, but New Mexico, they also just won their conference tournament um, in the Mountain West. But I love them. They're Last I checked, they're two-and-a-half-point favorites at the as the 11 seed against Clemson. So, I mean, I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not really a surprise. It seems like people, like everybody's really noticing how mm -hmm. good they are and that they are just the favorite. Just minus two now, just minus two, by the okay. way. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, just think about that, though. Like, I mean, the odds makers say they're the better team, even at the 6-11 and 11 matchup. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't let that scare you. I would just, I would grab maybe the value on New Mexico. Yeah. And then yeah. I could, I could totally see them beating um, Baylor even. With that poor yeah, defense right. that Baylor has, I mean, that's just asking for a March Madness upset with relying that much on your offense and really not having that much of a defensive presence. That is what March Madness upsets are scripted around, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, New Mexico, in my mind, is almost like a very, very similar team to Baylor. They have three really good guards that the offense revolves around. But, like, in New Mexico's case, they're all, like, seniors or upperclassmen. They have – like the whole team's older, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, I do like that. They have a lot of that the NBA blood ties. Like they had a lot of like, like two of their guards play. Their dads played in the NBA and were like <laughs> one championship. So I would love to know the stat on that relevancy. That'd be good. I have no clue. <laughs> hey, I have no clue. But but yeah, I'm just saying. Like I mean, these guys are ballers. Like I don't think they'll get absolutely screwed on calls either. Um, I don't think anybody will, honestly. But they I mean, usually pretty well. Yeah, these these refs, the refs are playing for the next round too. Like after the first games go, the refs all get graded and based on how you did in the first round, decides if you get to ref the next round yeah, and so right. on. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely a good accountability on that end. But, but yeah, I think if New Mexico gets a fairly ref game, they could they could really beat almost anyone. 
It'd be fun to see. Right. Like I said, 11 seeds, they make it far every year yeah. somehow. Um, it just seems like New Mexico could be that team that year, this year. Right. The final. If you notice too, like the MWC conference is so strong, like this year specifically. I mean, they've gotten a lot of love in the past, but I really do think these teams are really good. Like, there's multiple Mountain West teams that can make a run. Like we just we talked about Nevada mm-hmm. as a 10 seed just not too long ago. So I mean, they're they're battle tested. If you check their their strength of schedules and everything, that some of them are better than other Power Five teams. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting to see it's such a strong MWC this year. Um, final uh, point here: five, first four in teams um, have some relevancy, not just in the first round, um, but even in, beyond that. The one compelling stat is that the first four in team has won every single year that since its invention since 2019. So it's really with your favor to take one of these um, four first four in teams. I would have to assume you're going to take the 10 seed in this situation. Um, in assuming that, which 10 seed, if not both, do you like? I know we touched on that a little bit in the first four in game. Um, do you like here? Um, I personally lean a little bit more with um, the winner of Virginia versus Colorado State. I just think, and in my mind, they just have a better matchup against Texas. Mm -hmm. I don't think Texas has really played good basketball this season or even down the stretch um, for most of it. So I think think Texas is a pretty good matchup for either Virginia or Colorado State to win. Um, My issue with Boise and Colorado, who are really just as good of teams, is I, I just think Florida's been playing really good. Um, I think Florida's mm-hmm. been a good basketball team. Yeah, they just have finally started to put it together. Um, we did mention the center is going to be out. So, I mean, they do have – they have bodies. But, yeah, like losing your center is always going to hurt. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think I would have to lean with Texas losing rather than Florida. So, more but so – Honestly, more honestly you, could, you could go with either, though. Mm-hmm. Like – uh, yeah, either of those ten seeds. I I picked it last year. I had Pitt as that plan that won the next round, and I mean it worked last year too. So, yeah, but I think I think I am leaning towards UVA versus Virginia just because I'm going off of matchups. I think they got the best gotcha. shot to win that next game. Well, I and, think it's certainly worth picking given this stat. Um, you know, take them to win the first round, and maybe even so beyond that, like you said, um, pass to a slightly weaker second round matchup too. Right in this week's right. Season. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of how I got to lean. It's tough, too, without knowing. Because, I mean, you could even wait and see who wins these play-in games and then change your bracket if there's one of these teams you like a lot more than the other. It's um, really good yeah, because I don't know. I, I don't love Boise by any means, but I think Colorado could beat Florida. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you never know. Boise might beat Colorado. So wait and see wouldn't be the worst strategy there. But, everyone, those are the stats. And, you know – even just talking on the video with Sleeper, I learned a lot from listening to him. So I guarantee you learned something too. Definitely like the video if you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comment section what you're thinking here. And again, subscribe to the channel and keep getting this March content and stats that we will be posting throughout the this week and throughout the tournament. Thanks, guys.